Welcome to Love and Abuse, the show about helping you identify poisonous communication and toxic behavior. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. That's why it's important that you learn to pinpoint manipulative and controlling behavior so that you keep your power and your sanity. I'm your host, Paul Coliani. Welcome back to another episode of Love and Abuse. If this is your first time here, welcome. If this is your second or more time here, it's good to have you back. And I want to remind you that all information on this show is meant for educational purposes only. Always seek a professional for your mental health and well-being. I'm going to read you some snippets of an email, a certain situation that this person is in and may still be in. I'm not sure. This is a few months old. Uh, But I want to address the topic specifically because this can happen in relationships and probably does happen in the majority of relationships uh, of the people that listen to this show. And this applies to any type of relationship, whether it is a romantic relationship, a platonic relationship, a family relationship, emotional abuse, manipulation, control is all part of our makeup, believe it or not. I mean, we are all capable of doing this. Some of us do it to a certain level, and some of us do it without empathy. Some of us do it without caring, and some of us actually do care and still do it. Why do we still do it? Because we have coping mechanisms. We have survival mechanisms. They kick in, and we can turn into this manipulative, controlling person. Why would we do that? Why would we do that to someone we love? Because if you do that, you may not be adaptable to their behavior. Now, let me kind of explain that a little bit. Let's just say that uh, someone you love does something that you don't agree with. What do you do? Do you say, hey, would you please stop doing that? That might be a direct way to do it. Some people wouldn't. Some people would instead give dirty looks. Some people would instead set the other person up in a way to feel guilty about doing that behavior. I tell you what, the majority of emotionally abusive relationships that I've had personal interaction with, you know, with the people that are in those relationships, the majority of them experience the guilt tripping. And when you have somebody that guilt trips, you have an emotional abuser. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means they're doing bad behavior. It means they're hurting the other person uh, covertly sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's overt. Sometimes they are just very direct and making the other person attempt to feel guilty because they know how to make them feel guilty. If someone knows how to pull the right strings, they will know how to make you feel guilty. And I am capable of that. And you are capable of that. And everyone else in your life is capable of that. The question is, what do we do when someone tries to do that? And that's the question I try to answer in every show. I mean, it's not all about making you feel guilty. Sometimes it's making you feel crazy. Sometimes it's just controlling the situation. So you are confused or you aren't sure of yourself or You aren't sure of your intuition or your decision-making abilities. Sometimes the people in our lives can make us feel and think a certain way without us believing that's happening or knowing that's happening. Uh, And we may be completely unaware that's happening. And you are capable of that too. But hopefully you figure it out and you realize that's probably not the healthiest behavior. Now, if you are doing this and the other person's doing it as well, my question is always, who started it? That sounds like a childish question, but uh, who started it? When did it start? Who was the first person to do behavior that made you feel like you had to do that behavior back in order to get your needs met? And that's an important question because You'll figure out if you are on more of the defensive side, trying to protect and preserve yourself, 
or you're on the offensive side where you're doing it purposefully to control the other person. And it's good to be distinctive here. It's good to be discerning because it helps you define what side of the coin you're on. Am I on the manipulative, controlling, trying to make the other person do what I want them to do? And was I always like that in this relationship? Or did I start doing that because it felt like it was happening to me? If it feels like it's happening to you and you have to counter it with similar behavior, don't be too hard on yourself. Because I get a lot of emails that say, I think I am the emotional abuser. You may be doing emotionally abusive behavior, yes. You may be the emotional abuser. Yes, you could be that person. But I like to find out who started it. And when we find out who started it, we might be able to find out why the other person does the behavior too. And it's usually because they have no other way to get their needs met. They have no other way to feel love and connection. And when they don't feel those things, they try to find ways to feel those things. They try to dig a little deeper or manipulate in a way to create love and connection. And that's kind of an oxymoron because when you manipulate to get love, it's not really coming from a place of love. It's coming from a place of deception. Again, don't be hard on yourself and I'm not trying to put anyone down here. I come from an emotionally abusive background myself, meaning I was that person. The reason I did it is because I wanted my partner to change. I wanted her to do things that I wanted her to do. And I was the offensive one. I wasn't the defender. I was the offender. I wanted her to change. And so I showed up in ways that were unhealthy, toxic, and quite frankly, it caused her love for me to dissolve. And without love, you don't have much of a relationship left. All you have are strategies, techniques, tactics, manipulations, and controlling behaviors. And if that's all you have, then the relationship is really based on who can out-strategize each other. It does sound like I'm simplifying what happens, but in a nutshell, that seems to be what happens. If you have a relationship where one of you is the offender, the person who manipulates and controls to try to change the other person, And the other person turns into the defender where they feel like they have to manipulate and control in the reverse direction, even though that's not something they would normally do in any relationship. Now you have two people that are trying to outwit, outgun, outstrategize each other so that they can both get their needs met. But it is important to find out who started it. Because if you're in a relationship for three months, six months, And then they start doing things that make you feel bad, that make you feel guilty, that cause you to pull your hair out or make you think you're wrong. Then there might be a clear view of who started it. And when that happened, did your behavior eventually change? Doesn't usually change right away if you're not that type of person. But if you find out that your needs aren't getting met, like if you're going through this for a few months or even a couple of years, And you realize, geez, you know, I want to be in this relationship, but I have no connection. They don't seem to like me. They say things like, you know, I love you and stuff, but they don't show it or they do things that make me think otherwise. And then from that point on, the person who doesn't feel like they're getting their needs met and feels like they're going crazy and feels guilty all the time, they're going to start doing things to attempt to meet those needs. And those things are something that will be out of character. And this is one of the tricks in emotional abuse is that you can't reconcile that their character can come up with all these manipulative and deceptive things they're doing. You can't reconcile that what they're saying to you is real or valid because If it's real or valid, that must mean there's something wrong with you because you've developed trust with the other person. And when you trust someone, you trust what they say, you trust how they perceive you. 
And so when they suddenly start making you feel bad, they say things that cause you to feel bad about yourself, then you tend to wonder, maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe I do need to heal myself or work on myself. And when you're in that space, you tend to try harder. You tend to try to show them that you're really not the person they think you are. And so you might end up people pleasing. You might be overly helpful. You might be overly passionate. You might try a bunch of stuff, but it just doesn't seem to work because no matter what you do, you're made to be wrong or made to feel wrong. And when you're in that space, you will eventually feel like you're in so much deficit of an emotional connection that you'll reach deeper and try to figure out how to get that emotional connection. And that deeper reach, yes, does sometimes include manipulation and control and emotionally abusive behavior just because it just seems like that's their only language. When someone is in this space, you kind of have to meet them in that space, or at least you think you do, in order to get your needs met. So if you're in this space and you weren't the one that started it and you are the one that became the defender, the preserver of yourself because you want to feel loved, you want to feel connection, then yes, you may be doing emotionally abusive things, but it may be out of protecting yourself and wanting to feel love and connection. Now, that doesn't mean the person who was the offender, the person doing these behaviors first, didn't feel the same thing. They just brought these behaviors out as probably childhood survival mechanisms. Because when you're in any type of trauma or neglect or abusive situation as a child, even minor ones, children have a way of figuring things out. And one of those uh, things that they figure out is that they learn how to get their needs met, and this is going to sound like a broken record, by being manipulative or controlling or lying, deceiving. And um, this behavior isn't necessarily emotionally abusive when they're a child. You know, they're not being the emotional abuser. But what they do is they create these survival mechanisms that work when they're children because they realize that when they do X behavior, they get Y behavior from mommy or daddy or their caretakers or anyone else that might be in their life that they feel uh, neglected by or abused by. And when they are able to get any type of emotional connection, that's usually when the child realizes, hey, this behavior works. I need to do this more often. And so that behavior they continue to do, unfortunately, after they move out of the house and they're no, no longer with mommy and daddy. They're no longer with their caretakers. Now they're in adult relationships and they're trying to figure out how to act, how to behave. And actually, that's not even right. I shouldn't even say it that way. It's not that they're trying to figure it out. It's that they are doing the behaviors that they know how to do because they didn't learn any other way. And let me tell you, this is no excuse. It is an excuse. It is a reason, but it's no excuse after they realize what they're doing and What I mean by that is once you tell someone that they're hurting you or making you feel bad or you feel unsafe or anything that helps them realize that their behavior is causing an effect on you, a bad, a negative effect on you. Once they learn that they have the opportunity to change. And what I mean by that, and I'll use an example from my own life when I was married, if my wife said, you know, When you do that, it makes me feel so guilty and it makes me feel so bad about myself that I don't even feel like you love me. In fact, it makes me feel like you don't care about me at all. I don't feel supported. And it really, really hurts me when you do that. Now, if she said that to me, that would have hit me like a ton of bricks. That would have made me feel awful, but that's a good thing. I would want to feel awful because it would have made me realize that uh, my behavior was terrible because I didn't realize how terrible my behavior when I was, it was when I was doing it. 
But I realized it after she left because it was real. It was in my face and it turned out she had to leave in order for me to realize how bad it was. She had to leave that to realize that I was doing bad behavior and her leaving was precisely what I needed to learn. But if she said those words, you know, when you do that, it hurts me and it makes me feel guilty and it makes me feel like you don't even love me. That would have certainly kicked me in the butt. And now I don't know if that would have been the impetus to help me heal, but it would have been effective. And I'm not saying this to you know put her on the spot or make her the bad guy here because she was absolutely not the bad guy. She was the innocent one. I was the guilty one. But if she had said that, that would have made the difference. But the reason she didn't say that is because she really didn't know how to articulate that. She really didn't know what I was doing. She didn't think I was being manipulative. She didn't think I was being hurtful. She just knew she hurt. And that's the toughest part of this. When you're in a relationship and you trust the person and you love the person and they're doing things to make your heart hurt so bad or make you feel guilty or bad, when you're in that space, you don't really expect bad behavior from someone you've come to love and trust. You just don't expect it from them. She did not expect that from me. So it would be very difficult for her to articulate that or have that comprehension at the time. And the only reason she was able to figure it out is because when we separated, she was finally able to think without my influence. She was finally able to be with herself without me around. When you're not around a toxic person, you do think differently. When you're with them or you know they're in your life, even if you're away for a week, you do have some time to yourself, but you know you're coming back to them. Every thought contains that toxic person. So it's very important to understand that when you're in a toxic relationship or emotionally abusive relationship of any sort, as long as you're in the relationship, it's very hard to think outside the relationship. And your thinking changes when you're outside the relationship. This is why sometimes the best thing you can do is separate for a while. I'm not saying that you should, and I'm not saying that's the only solution. I'm just saying sometimes separating helps you think outside that toxic box that you're in. It's like taking a fish out of toxic water and putting it in a tank with clean, fresh water and the pH balance is good and there's no ammonia. You can tell I've done some work with fish. And uh, the uh, fish can breathe easily and nicely. It's a whole new environment. It's, it's something completely different than they're used to. And then the other one, maybe they were in pain. Maybe they couldn't breathe well. That's how I see a toxic environment. I mean, this is one of the analogies I use is when you're in that environment where you're in pain, you're in some sort of emotional pain, and you can't breathe, and you're having a lot of stress and anxiety, when you take yourself out of that environment and put yourself in a very clean, healthy environment, you don't have to think about all these stressors that were there before. They're not there anymore. And one way you can tell this is true is to think of a toxic person in your life right now. Just go ahead and think of this toxic person. You know, however you define toxicity, I like to use the word toxic some people will say uh, unhealthy person. Some people will say a poisonous person. Some people will say that jerk. <laughs> so think of your life and think of this jerk in your life. The connections that you have to this person may be few, may be many, but these connections are part of your toxic environment. They are part of how you think about the world, They're how you perceive the world. But if I said that person decided to move away, like across the other side of the world, and they cut off contact with you and never wanted to talk to you or speak to you again, and just decided to disappear, let's just say that happened. Or you woke up one day and they were gone, completely gone. You have no idea where they went. I don't know if that is hurtful. I don't know if that's helpful, but... Think about that person gone. Like there's no connection to them whatsoever. When you sit in this space without that person in your life at all, 
What's there? What are you feel? What are you thinking? Now, there might be an initial shock. Like, oh my God, what, I, what do I do without this person? There might be that. Or there might be a sadness. Like, why would they do that? I'm not worthy. I'm not lovable. You might have that. But what else is there? Let's just say they disappeared and it's been a week. Where are you now inside yourself? When you think about this toxic person and they're not in your life anymore, where are you with that? Because what you're going to discover is how you feel and how you think without this person as an influence in your life. And you do think differently. Because if you go, you know, using this example, a month from when they left, what are you doing now? What are your day-to-day activities like? What do you think every day when you wake up? What's the first thought in your mind? Let's just say it's six months from that time. No clue where they are. And you may or may not think about them at all. But here you are living life and they're not in your life anymore. What's going through your mind? Are, are the stresses less? Are they gone? Is there any anxiety? Is that gone? This is how you test what it would be like to be separated from someone. You try it on and you discover what you think and feel without them in your life. I'm not trying to promote divorce. I'm not trying to promote separation. I'm not trying to promote anything. I'm just asking you to try this on. Just trying to visualize it and figure out where you go with it. Because then you discover how you think. My goal in this little segment here is to help you discover that the way you think with a toxic person in your life is so different than the way you think without the toxic person in your life. And uh, the reason I'm trying to emphasize that is that I do get a lot of messages from people that say, I don't know, I can't live without this person, or I love this person so much, I don't know what to do. I don't want to leave this person because X, Y, Z. And there's all kinds of things that they tell me that are really all valid and all important. But at the same time, I hear the limitation. You know, I, I read it in the emails. I read the limitations in their words. And I hear it and think about it in my head the limitations that they're placing on themselves. There's nothing else I can do. I have no choice. I have no option. I get all kinds of emails like that. I have no choice. I want you to hear those words in your head and then ask yourself, what would happen if an event was thrust upon you and you really had no choice but to accept that you wouldn't be in this situation anymore? Like I got an email I'm going to read you parts of in a moment here that said, I have very little choice because if I move out, I'm going to go back to my hometown where I have no job and no money. I'm not sure what to do. So she put herself, at least in her mind, with the limitation of that thought of leaving and probably talked herself out of leaving because she, quote, has no choice. That doesn't mean the choices won't have some sort of hardship or the feelings of impossibility. It doesn't mean that you won't suffer because I won't lie to you, leaving an emotionally abusive relationship or a toxic situation can cause suffering because sometimes it gets worse before it gets better, but it always gets better. Not because you've left a toxic person, but because you start to think more clearly without that toxic person, because it doesn't mean the toxic person has to be out of your life unless you want that to happen. But it does mean that without any of the influence of the toxic person in your life, you get to think clearly sometimes for the first time in a long time. And that clear thinking, that clear head suddenly opens up your world and what you thought you had no option or you were stuck before, suddenly you aren't so stuck and suddenly there are options. And it is very hard to think like that where you believe you have more options when you're still stuck in that fish tank with the toxic water and the high pH levels or the high ammonia levels and it's burning you. It it burns. And all you can think about is I wish it would stop burning. And so I want you to just kind of keep that in mind. I'm going to go through this email really quickly and just read portions of it. Uh, This person says, I am struggling to reach a conclusion of how much my boyfriend's emotionally abusive and if I should leave. 
So her first thought is, you know, how much emotional abuse is he doing here? I'm not sure. I don't think that's the right question. You know, she says, I'm struggling to reach a conclusion about how much my boyfriend is emotionally abusive and if I should leave. So the if I should leave part, yeah, that's an important question. But how much he's emotionally abusive? I'll repeat, it's not the question that you want to ask. The question that you want to ask is, if I stay for another year and nothing changes or it gets worse, either way, will I be okay with it? I think that's the real question. I think when you're in a situation where you can't figure out how much emotional abuse is going on, the real question is, will I be okay if it continues? That's the question. If the answer is no, then that's the answer. So I'm going to go on here. Um, He didn't show any of this anger or highly defensiveness or critical and controlling behavior in the first two years. You know, this is a person that may not be uh, intrinsically emotionally abusive or wanting to control or manipulate someone, at least at first, because two years is a long time before they start showing signs. Um, It usually comes out in the first few months, if not sooner. I have seen an average amount of time between two and six months. And what I mean by that is the first couple months are the honeymoon period you know, especially in a romantic relationship. The first couple months of the relationship, everything's wonderful. Everything's great. In fact, it's the best relationship you've ever been in. And you can't believe you found this amazing person. And then the reality strikes as you start getting these little feelings, these little twinges of guilt and these little doubts about yourself. Like maybe I did something wrong. I didn't mean to make him or her so angry. Uh, Maybe I'm doing something bad on and on. And uh, this is what happens. The emotional abuser is very good at making you think you did something wrong. And so this is important to understand that when you're starting a relationship, it can start off great. Like she said, he didn't show any signs of these angry or defensive or critical or controlling behaviors in the first two years. Because it's two years, you know, there's a good timeline for me to determine that perhaps he didn't go into this relationship with the automatic default of emotionally abusive behavior. But I would like to know what happened in two years that he suddenly shifted. I'm not trying to blame the person who wrote the email, but I bet you something happened. Either some change took place or you had some conversation or he changed his mind about something. You know, some people get into relationships and they realize, you know what? I don't really want to be in this relationship. I'm not saying this is the case here. I'm just saying, you know, anyone listening might have a similar circumstance. Suddenly the other person changes and you're like, what the heck is going on? Sometimes people change their mind in the relationship for whatever reason. And then they start acting out or they start misbehaving or they start acting differently, but in small ways. Small ways that rub you the wrong way and you can't figure out why they're suddenly acting this way. Or they could be big ways like this person. Whatever it is, they just act differently. And if it's been over six months or over a year, or in this case, two years, you got to start questioning what happened that caused that change. Now, maybe nothing, maybe nothing uh, obvious, but I like to go in that direction first. Like what happened that caused that change? It could be like, well, maybe we were talking about having a baby, but we never actually got any further in that, in that talk. And maybe that turned him off. And from that point on, uh, he is now acting out or lashing out and he's just not communicating what he really thinks and feels. So he acts out in other ways, in emotionally abusive ways. So that could be the case as well. I'm going to continue reading. She says, On one hand, he is kind, caring, supportive, empathetic, but he can be equally as cruel and shout at me and blow up if I so much as suggest he do something different. So again, this is something that it sounds like he developed much later in the relationship. And I see this kind of behavior from people who just don't want to communicate what's really on their mind. A situation that I'm outlining for you here is one person feels like they should say something, 
but they don't, and instead does behavior to help the other person reach a conclusion of what they should do. And that is very coercive. It's very manipulative. And it dissolves love and connection. It absolutely dissolves it. Because when you expect support and love from the other person, and what they're doing is making their partner feel bad and guilty, now you have a recipe for disaster. And the gap between you is only going to widen. It never works. I mean, emotionally abusive behavior does not work. It does not reach the outcome that the abuser wants to reach. Because imagine the abuser as a child, when they weren't abusive, they were developing survival mechanisms. They did those behaviors to get love and connection from their parents. And that's just one example of why a child would do certain behaviors because they want to get love and connection. But let's just say that a child wants love and connection and attention from their caretakers, their parents, and they do these behaviors to get it and they figure out, well, that's the only way to get it. Or they do behaviors to avoid pain or abuse. And um, these behaviors worked back then. And you can say, hey, those behaviors kept that child safe. Those behaviors kept that child feeling any type of semblance of love or connection. But today, those behaviors don't work. So that's why I'm saying that the person doing the behaviors believe they work because they got different outcomes when they were a child. But when you're adults and you're in an equal relationship and you're supposed to treat each other fairly and with kindness and respect, then what ends up happening is when you don't receive that, you get the outcomes that you don't expect. So the manipulator will try harder. And the person being manipulated or controlled or abused will also try harder, but in the opposite direction. They'll usually be nicer and kinder and more helpful and more compassionate and more empathetic, seeing that the abuser really had a, a victim childhood. But then the recipient of the abuse will then again, like I said, go to controlling or manipulative behavior just to find out if that works because they can't get it any other way. But uh, my point is it works in childhood, but it doesn't work as an adult and the adults don't realize it doesn't work until they get bad outcomes enough and they finally see that they are the cause of their own problems. They are the common denominator of their failed relationships. So let me get back on track and read you the rest of this, uh, these portions of this email. Uh, she says, my self-worth is at an all-time low. Thinking of breaking up with him scares me as I think he would get extremely angry. Just right there, I'm going to stop right there and say, when you feel like someone is going to get extremely angry, there's something that you need to weigh. You need to weigh that sometimes anger is used to avoid talking about a situation it's also used to help prevent something, an outcome that the other person doesn't want. Like they may get really angry to prevent you from leaving. They may get really angry for, to prevent you from talking about something that puts them in a bad light. Anger is, you know, can be useful. It can be helpful in regular situations, but in emotionally abusive situations where someone uses anger to keep you in your place, you really need to consider if that's the way you want to live for the rest of your life. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't avoid people that get angry and violent. You definitely want to watch out for people who have the capability of getting physically aggressive. But if it's just anger to put you in your place and make you shut up, then that's a control mechanism. If someone you love gets angry at you every time you bring up a certain subject, they don't want to talk about it, but that's not all. They also don't want a resolution to it. They want to keep the control over you about it. Now, I'm simplifying that because it doesn't mean that's always the case. It just means you have to watch out when anger is used for particular times when it could be something that you can talk about and you know get some clarity on as a couple or as two people in a relationship. But when anger is used to overpower everything else about that subject, then you have a bigger problem here. And if anger is always the go-to for one of you, then what you'll get is uh, no results ever. You'll never get results if it's always anger that takes over 
and then there's a big argument and then there's a stonewalling where one person walks out and says, I don't want to talk about it anymore. And you never get to resolution. So if anger is always the default, you'll never find resolution. So you have to be really careful about people who use anger to control conversations and control you. She goes on and say, recently in front of other people, he cut me off and said they didn't need to hear what I was saying. This was profoundly upsetting and humiliating to me. He always has a great explanation afterward and implies that I am over-exaggerating or misinterpreting the situation. So I don't even know if I should comment on this because it is so over the top. She's feeling humiliated and upset because he cut her off in front of other people. Absolutely. You have every right to feel that way. In fact, your comment should be, I don't want you to ever cut me off in front of people again. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. It makes you look like you don't care about what I have to say. It makes me feel invalidated. It, and it hurts me that you would do that. I don't like when you put me down. And no matter what the excuse this person comes up with, if you're in this situation and someone does that to you, they cut you off in front of other people, no matter what the excuse is later, the excuses don't matter because you just want the behavior to stop. I want you to remember that. It doesn't matter what the excuse is. It could be the most valid, the most logical, the most reasonable excuse ever. But the behavior has to stop. And that's what you need to request. That's what you need to focus on. They'll do the redirect often. They'll often try to redirect you and say, well, the reason I did that is because ABC. Because I didn't want to make you look like a fool because what you were trying to say was wrong or something like that. Even though that would kind of be hurtful to hear. But it doesn't matter what the excuse is. It doesn't matter what the reason is. What you want is the behavior to stop. In fact, if you get anything out of this episode, that's all you need to remember. I just want you to stop doing that behavior, regardless of the reason, regardless of the excuse. It doesn't matter. The behavior that causes you to feel bad, you don't want in your life, especially from someone you love and you're supposed to trust and have a bond with. You don't want that type of behavior in your life. So you ask the person, will you please stop doing that? Because it humiliates me, it hurts me, it embarrasses me. And if they say, yeah, but I only do it because whatever, you say, that's fine. I know why you do it. I just don't want you to do it. Will you stop? They may have the best excuse in the world, but what some people are very good at is convincing you that their excuse is valid. And it could be valid to them. I'm not even going to say it's not, but it doesn't matter because if behavior hurts you, it needs to be known. So that's where I would go with that particular one. And I'm just about done here. She said, how do I get a clear headed sense of what is going on? Should I invest more time and energy into the relationship or is this a toxic situation and I need to leave for my own good? I would appreciate a response as I'm beginning to think I'm going crazy. Well, um, hopefully you got a lot from this episode and it kind of answered that question, especially uh, being separate for a while and getting a clear head. That's how you get a clear head is you get yourself out of the toxic environment or if you can do it while still with the person and have this visualization, like I said, you know, you wake up and they're no longer there. How do you think now? What are your thoughts now? What would be your next step now? And is your life better? Is it worse? You know, you have this thought and you play it out to the fullest. That's one thing you can do. If you can't get out of the house, you can't get out of the situation or the relationship, you have to do some visualization to find out how you'd think if you were separated. That's the best way to get a clear head. Also, the question of if this doesn't change or gets worse, would I be okay with it? Would I be able to handle it? That's another way to get a clear head of what's going on, or at least what you should do next. And then her question of, should I invest more time and energy into the relationship, or is this just a toxic situation I need to leak for good? And you need to be really careful about investing more time and energy in the sense where you are nicer or kinder and overly helpful and doing things over the top to show them that you're a good person, to show them that you're really, really trying. 
You need to be really careful about doing that because you shouldn't have to try harder at being who you've always been. You shouldn't have to do that. That should already be a given. They already know who you are. The way you showed up at first, unless you change drastically, who you are should be how you are loved and who you are loved as. If you have to change who you are, you're going to get tired of doing that because now you're trying too hard and investing too much and you're not going to have much left over for yourself because now you're compensating for what they're doing. And if somebody is abusing you or being hurtful towards you and you have to try harder to be nicer to them, to show them, no, I really do care about you and I really want this relationship to work, you shouldn't have to try harder. Trying harder actually does the opposite, typically. In fact, I've never seen this work any other way. If you have to try to be nicer and kinder and show them that you have a bigger heart than they think you do, you're probably going in the wrong direction. Now, that doesn't mean you should go in the opposite direction. It just means you need to be very clear in yourself, like she said, you know, how do I get a clear head about this, so that you know what you want and then ask for certain behaviors to stop. That's it. And I know that's hard. I know it's hard to maybe convey this to certain people. But you should not have to try any harder to be who you already are and try to amplify that because that was already a given when you met because you're who they met. And if you're trying to be something more than who they met, then you're going to burn yourself out and the relationship's actually going to get more toxic because as you try harder, they usually will be more abusive. They will usually be more controlling or aggressive or manipulative. And when you try harder and they're doing more of the bad behavior, you can tell it's not going to go anywhere. It only gets worse. And you can't fix that. The only way you can fix this is to stop the hurtful behavior. You have to have the hurtful behavior stop. And you have to make it clear what that behavior is. And don't get caught up in the weeds of all the excuses and the reasoning and the talking. Don't get caught up in that stuff because what will happen is that you will forget that all you want is the behavior to stop and then you will start reasoning or rationalizing away their bad behavior and making yourself feel bad, which is something we don't want to do. We don't want to make ourselves feel bad. We want to convey to the people in our lives what they do that cause a problem or cause hurt in our lives. When you can convey specific behavior that they do, and that can be tough with very crafty, manipulative people. It can be very tough to figure out exactly what behavior they're doing that is causing this, but that's why it's important to pay attention. The, the moment you feel hurt or bad in some way, you have to ask yourself, okay, what did they just do? What behavior did they just do to make me feel that? And then once you pinpoint that, you can start asking for what you want. And if you don't get what you want, that's when bigger decisions might need to be made. Share this with others that might benefit. Love and Abuse is the official podcast of The Mean Workbook. It's an assessment and healing guide for difficult relationships, containing a 200-point checklist to help you not only pinpoint the exact behaviors causing the difficulties in your relationship, but also clearly reveal to you why you leave so many interactions feeling bad. The workbook will help you make the next best relationship decisions for both of you. Use it to understand your own behaviors and how they affect those you love, or use it together to reveal issues to you that you both need to work on. Visit loveandabuse.com for more information. This show exists to remind you that you are not alone and you're not going crazy. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. You deserve honesty and sincerity. You deserve to be treated as worthy and significant because you are. Thanks again for joining me. We'll talk again soon. Mm -hmm.